All right, so we are here with Sam, but for the first time ever, he is going to share his stories from his gas station from hell. <laughs> well, technically, uh, these stories were shared on my Facebook page February of 2015. Yeah, it was the first time I saw a video. Uh, yeah. So, basically, I have the story in front of me, but I'll be basically using it to refresh my mind about how this went down. But essentially, uh, when I posted, first thing that was in my head was, the cycle is complete. People are privileged. My brother's Facebook page would remember his stories, interesting and terrifying gas station stories of working at this job off I-71. Well, he switched jobs, and that meant there was now an opening for some late-night gas station attendant making some sweet moolah by dealing with, apparently, people from another fucking dimension. That would be my cue. Now, on the first two days, nothing noteworthy really happened, besides me working out a gas station conflict involving a Spanish crew that didn't speak a word of English, and they didn't know how to pump gas. Meaning I had to basically use my wits and shadow puppet skills to teach them, which was a little messy. But on the last day, things got downright uncanny. My shift started with the obvious omen of opening the door to the outside of the store and being jumped by a mouse who dragged itself across the floor with its hind legs and one of those super glue mouse trap things. It was like a fucking transhumanist nightmare. This fusion between mouse and trap, life and death, and rather being defeated by the sticky note of power, the mouse had apparently decided to shirk off its mortal bonds and transcend to becoming some kind of existential monster, loaded with insane knowledge of a dark power. The mouse just runs across the store using its trap like a sled, activates the sliding doors, and escapes into the world, presumably to burn down orphanages and cause the death of the human soul. But my knife didn't improve very much as a pool tournament was in town that year. And every front runner, road warrior, and major player wannabe decided to show up at my door trying to break down with their large denominations of bank while flashing their eyes at the rivals that are over by the smoothie machine, checking to see if they could see how much of a high roller they were dealing with by like the flavor of fucking Slurpee they were getting. The crowning moment over this was a man wearing no less than 10 cast iron skull rings trying to pay for a Snickers bar with two hundreds. At which point I made a noise that probably sounded like a balloon getting punched by a fistful of screaming cats. I was like, ah! <laughs> Needless to say, after all those fucking big rollers coming through there, we ran out of booze, cleaned us out of house and home. And also, all our iPhone chargers, they bought all of them. We had just gotten a fresh stock that day. We had like 200, three hours in the shift, all of them gone. That left us with no electronic equipment and all the really offbeat, surrealist brands of alcohol that were like brewed in the woods at 345 on a full moon or like 3% virgin blood. I had a guy come in he was looking for a 12 pack, which we did not have. I offered him an eight pack of some of the devil swill. He got really, really quiet. And with wide eyes, he just looked at me. He's like, but haven't you heard the rumors? At which point he walked backwards out the door. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. yeah, no, this is, this is, pretty, uh, this is pretty on point. So as my third night came to a close, I was pretty determined to end on a good note, and I spent most of my time cleaning the outside of the store in anticipation of my backup, who would swoop in eagle style and save me from this entire existence. This hope was first shattered by the sound of sirens as a police officer pulled a man over into the local hotel's parking lot and started waving a flashlight around his head like a lone ranger at the last rave of the law, and he'd come to inspire us not to do drugs with the power of funk. Almost on cue, I noticed that the nearby trash can, I'd look, Oh, our trash can is noticeably a jar. And when I go to fix it, I discover something inside. It was about a G of wet Chicago weed wrapped in a Twinkies bar wrapper. Glaring up at me like an ancient tomb guardian was that little yellow gummy bear. And his eyes had been sharpied in black and angry, judging me with cold, calculating intelligence. I think they built that gas station on an Indian burial site. <laughs> and that's the story. <laughs> the first of many. I think you had like four. Yeah, that's probably the lightning bolt story, the falling car story, and the Valentine's night story, which is, I remember with a specific fondness because I was double dealing jobs at the Myers and the gas station. And I literally had to leave one day of working at the gas station to go into my Myers job. And I was just walking through there like, my life is a living nightmare of weird, crazy bullshit. And it was a blizzard outside and I was just sitting there staring out the window and basically writing that Facebook post. And I turned around, my boss was reading it over my shoulder and she was just like, you can go home if you want. And I'm like, <laughs> like no, no, we're good. We're good. Was the lightning bolt story the same one with the dumpster vulture? Yes. Yes. It's funny how I could say that without any context and just be like, yep, that was that same day. <laughs> 
course, a lightning bolt struck the vulture, but it did not. So, yep, that was... Uh, Something to look forward to for a future reading. Yeah, you could say that. But that's the story. Swoop in eagle style at the last rave of the law.